Good. Welcome to our session. It's early in the conference on anti-slavery, liberalism, and empire building in transatlantic perspective, the United States and Europe, 1841 to 1881. My name is Leslie Butler, and I teach at Dartmouth College. Um, and I will be mo moderating the session, and then we'll make a comment after the three panelists speak, and then turn it over to you. Uh, we have three very exciting, very rich papers, I think, that are going to provoke a lot of discussion um, that I look forward to hearing. Um, what I'm going to do now is just introduce each of our speakers, and they will be speaking in the order that they appear in the program, which is neither alphabetical nor chronological, but it's the one that's in the program, so we're going to stick with it. Um, and then, as I say, I'll give a, some brief um, remarks on the papers together as a group and then turn it over to, to all of you and to our panelists for discussion. Uh, so we will be starting, as I say, uh, following the order of the program, with, with Timothy Roberts, who, um, and I should say this is a very transatlantic panel too, which you'll hear as I, as I talk about it. Um, he currently teaches at Western Illinois University after a, I think, six-year stint at Bill Kent University in Turkey. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Oxford, and his first book, which was called Distant, Distant Revolutions, 1848 and the Challenge to American Exceptionalism, was published in 2009 by the University of Virginia Press. Um, our second speaker is the Houston local in the group, and that's Caleb McDaniel, an assistant professor at Rice University. He earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins uh, in 2006 and will shortly be publishing um, his first book, which will be titled, at least is provisionally titled, The Ever Restless Ocean, Garrisonian Abolitionists, Transatlantic Reform and the Problem of Democracy, 1820 to 1870. And then our third speaker is Enrico Del Lago, who, uh, though from Italy, is a lecturer in American history um, at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And in true transatlantic fashion, if that wasn't enough, uh, Dr. Del Lago was actually educated at the Uni University of Rome, the University of Kansas, and University College London, uh, from which he earned his PhD in 1999. He has co-edited two volumes on slavery in the American South and comparative perspective, and his monograph entitled Agrarian Elites, American Slaveholders and Southern Italian Landholders, uh, sorry, Landowners, 1815 to 1861, was published by LSU Press in 2005. Well, thanks very much, uh, Leslie, and thanks to Enrico uh, for organizing this panel on the, uh, I guess, the, the liberal Atlantic world of the mid-19th century. Scholarship on modern imperialism lately has sought to critique explanations of U.S. territorial expansion in the long 19th century as distinct from the imperial trajectories of European powers. Perhaps following the anti-exceptionalist lead of Edward Said, post-colonialists post now often point to two periods to illuminate commonalities between American expansion and colonization projects of Britain, France, and the Netherlands in Africa and Asia, the era of the early republic in the United States through its war with Mexico, and later the US war with Spain and insurgents in the former Spanish colony of the Philippines in the late, in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Important aspects of the Civil War era, meanwhile, also have been reinterpreted. These reinterpretations challenge studies emphasizing the uniqueness of America's sectional crisis. Lately, comparative studies have considered parallels between the South's secession, the nature of American slave keeping in the metropolis, the development of President Lincoln's liberal nationalism, the rise of lost cause mythology, as well as the post-war guarantee of citizenship to the freedmen. All these have been compared lately with events in 19th century Europe and Latin America. More could be done, however, to identify the peculiarities of the Civil War's paradoxical outcome, a national state claiming new authority to define U.S. citizenship, empowered to enforce the cap a capitalistic order in the West, yet reticent in its enforcement of national civil rights in the former Confederate States. Comparison of the American case with its counterpart, France, during the Second Empire and Third Republic is useful in this way to illustrate the common challenge to civic ideals in the Atlantic world 
of the 19th century presented by the territorial ex extension of central political power of republics. Conflict in liminal or weakly integrated areas of the two regimes, the Great Plains and the Deep South on one hand, the Department of Algeria on the other, illuminate discrepancies in both the American and French cases between pretensions to civic multicultural nation building and the realities of ethnic unequal empire. Now comparison of any two regimes suggests one or the other's privileging over other potential cases. Why America and France? The American federal system and the unitary French state, of course, were marked by important differences. These different political cultures, scholars have often explained in terms of the different outcomes of their founding revolutions. But these republics' celebration of inclusive and even exceptional civic liberty through racialized ordering of national or imperial borders locates them as related, not exceptional, exemplars of Atlantic empire building. Moreover, comparison of American and European nation making in the 19th century can be useful to identify not only parallel practices of states, which was the focus of traditional comparative history, but also to see mutual influences between expansionist policies in the old and new worlds. In the period after the so-called age of democratic revolutions when Atlantic history ended, according to an older generation of transnational scholars. This essay, therefore, briefly tries to rethink this. It traces the transnational, or we might say transimperial connections between America and France in the era of the Civil War. Such interactions will challenge national or imperial arguments for exceptionalism and illuminate similarities as well as differences between the two liberal republics, two republics asserting sovereignty through extension of territorial empire. Access to land, obligations to labor, and rights of citizenship were common and conflicted threads that wove together the respective American and French extensions of power into previously unincorporated border areas. The year 1848 was a watershed for the two republics. That year saw the destruction of the French monarchy, the establishment of the Second Republic in France, a republic that promulgated a constitution abolishing colonial slavery and guaranteeing the right to work. These provisions were controversial in America. And coupled with the Paris workers' uprising in June of 1848, the notorious June days, an uprising crushed by a French general, Eugene Cavignac, an action that earned him promotion to command of French forces in Algeria, <laughs> turned most Americans against the French democratic experiment. However, an aspect of the French Constitution of 1848 that received less attention in the American press in the, in, in the United States was this enunciation of Algeria as an incorporated territory, distinct from French colonies in India, the Pacific, the Caribbean, and West Africa. European settlers in Algeria gained full French citizenship, reflecting Algeria's status as an integral part of the French homeland. And unlike voters in the colonies, they were eligible to run to vote for the president of the Second Republic. White electors and soldiers in Algeria helped elect Louis Napoleon, the Second Republic's first and only president. Meanwhile, indigenous Algerians gained neither the franchise nor citizenship. The Second Republic's abolition of slavery and proclamation that it never employed power against the liberty of any people suggested its liberal reform. But these steps accompanied and rationalized an aggressive policy of empire building in North Africa. Meanwhile, 1848 in the United States marked the windup of the war with Mexico, resulting in the creation of US territories to the Pacific. The United States Constitution provides for congressional authority for territorial legislation. Although beginning with the Northwest Ordinance, elected territorial legislatures, along with federally appointed territorial governors, became the American practice. Of course, controversy would swirl in the 1850s over the prospects of territories deciding locally whether to allow or exclude slavery in their preparation for statehood. Meanwhile, US law before and after the Civil War largely enforced racial restrictions on citizenship. 
Mexico had abolished such restrictions from, its, from the Spanish colonial period, but when Mexico ceded its northern territory to the U.S., the so-called savage Indian tribes living there, this was the language of the Treaty of, of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and in laws of 1850, creating the New Mexico and Utah territories lost citizenship rights. Indeed, New Mexico, Utah, Kansas, and Nebraska, all territories, all restricted U.S. citizenship to free white men. In the post-Civil War era, the slaughterhouse cases of the Supreme Court would delegate definition of citizenship to states, allowing the perpetuation of, of states' enforcement and definition of citizenship, largely maintaining, therefore, white citizenship. Advocates of black civil rights celebrated Congress's extension of manhood suffrage to U.S. territories in 1867, but a commentator in 1898 saw this as evidence of Congress's authority to establish government just as it pleases with little or no regard to the principles of self-government. Congress is under no obligation to grant even a restricted suffrage to the inhabitants of any new soil we may acquire. Congress is indeed morally bound to give the very best government that circumstances will permit, but it is also morally bound not to be carried away by theories of human rights, which even the states themselves ignore. Indeed, as this quotation illustrates, in the United States, as in France, expansion of Republican state power meant land for white settlers. Thus, territories, because of their intended integration with the metropolis, the extension of Republican sovereignty into the territories as potential states cultivated patriotism. The American press, the French press of the mid 50 years of the 19th century were colored with heroic stories of skirmishes in territories between soldiers and settlers on the one hand and indigenous peoples on the other. Likewise, the two governments declared official policies of discouraging large accumulations of land by big business interests. The ideology of both republics was to uh, provide land for yeoman farmers in the West, in America, in North Africa, in the French case. Territories thus had an ideological function different from the function of colonies, which concept in America and France was merely cash crop islands or coastal trading posts, but territories were an element of uh, the respective senses of exceptionalism in the United States and France. Actually, land, American land reformers' efforts to make territorial land easy for settlers to acquire often failed. In general, defenders of slavery before the Civil War opposed homestead legislation, fearful that such policy would hasten restriction of slavery. These arguments were made both outright and through nativist arguments. The possibility that land reform laws would not limit land access to US citizens uh, jeopardized the comfort of whites only provisions for citizenship since immigrants were likely to be anti-slavery. In this way, and this is a connection between the two regimes, French socialism became an important argument among American conservatives against territorial development under the auspices of free labor. A Texas congressman, for example, argued against a homestead bill's provision that qualifying settlers be landless. He argued that such reform would be a wilder scheme of socialism than the French socialist ever dreamed in his wildest visions. Pro-slavery opposition to homestead legislation in America thus enabled anti-slavery Republicans to consider both emancipation of slavery and territorial expansion as consistent with transnational liberal progress. Thus, U.S. homestead legislation needed the Civil War because it provided a temporary hiatus of Southern representatives in Congress hostile to the measure. During and after the Civil War, Northern advocates saw the Homestead Act of 1862 as a means to attract immigrants intending to become U.S. citizens. Like French imperialists who offered land, building materials, seeds, work animals, and tools to Europeans to go to Algeria, but granted them rights to the land on condition of taking up French citizenship, liberal Americans in the United States foresaw territorial land grants as a means 
of national consolidation. Yet following the Civil War, as in the antebellum period, during Reconstruction, the specter of French radicalism was resurrected to undermine federal civil rights legislation. The Paris Commune of 1871 gained notoriety throughout the Atlantic world. It was used in America among American conservatives as a warning to ridicule African American political leadership in the South as long as that leadership received US military protection. And more important, to oppose any scheme among radical Republicans to confiscate plantation lands in former slave areas for redistribution to the freedmen. Such federal government activism again gained the stigma of socialism and therefore contrary to an exceptional American political tradition. Both France and America abolished slavery during the mid-19th century but neither regime awarded land to freedmen. Abolition fulfilled and exhausted the emancipationist impulse. And therefore liberal reform as a means of national consolidation in both places um, was similar. Uh, French policies of liberal reform were more like American practice than opponents of American civil rights reform recognized. Still, the Civil War was instrumental in the development of American power. It gathered material and ideological resources for removal and destruction of Native Americans on American borders. The Indian Wars of the 1870s proportionally were the most destructive wars of North America during the 19th century. The Plains Wars were, if not a logical outcome of the Civil War and effect of its momentum, to demand unconditional surrender of opponents of the pro-business Republican Party and production of a powerful state that consolidated the country's territorial expansion, aligning its political borders with the boundaries of its political democracy, religious culture, and industrializing economy, expanding opportunities for white and black men, justified and developed military measures necessary for political organization of the West. From this perspective, the American Civil War marks a variation on, not an exception to, the history of 19th century liberal imperialism. Several parallels between the American settlement of the West and French settlement of, Al of Algeria, as well as resistance to these policies on the local level seem clear. The career of Abd al-Qadir in organizing the resistance to French occupation of North Africa, at one point he was chased by one third of the French army bore some similarity to the notoriety of the Sioux chief Sitting Bull in the Dakotas. Both national governments offered land rights as an incentive to encourage migration and settlement on the frontier. In 1863, decree of Napoleon III instituted gradual distrib distribution of traditional tribal lands to individual Algerians. This plan was intended to protect native land from a colonial occupation by establishing what Napoleon called an Arab kingdom. But it actually had the opposite effect as a result of manipulation by French officials, settlers, and tribal collaborators. Such a quixotic system of Algerian land management by French empire builders resembled the working of the US reservation system, which culminated in the 1887 Dawes Act. Napoleon's 1865 decree, meanwhile, offered French citizenship to Algerian Muslims on condition that Muslims reject the competence of religious courts, madrasas. This had no, religious, no legislative parallel in the, in the United States. Indeed, Napoleon, in proclaiming such policy, stated his objective to not treat Arabs like the Indians of North America. But the US government's funding of missions to the Arabs Sorry, the U.S. government's funding of missions to the Indians, the role of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions in creating the Dawes Act, suggests a tacit religious test for citizenship in the American case similar to French policy in Algeria. Specific French and American mutual influence on territorial land policies remains to be documented. But the writings of the transnational individual Alexis de Tocqueville and circulation in France of information about the U.S. Homestead Act suggests the possibility for tracing correct, direct connections between the two republics seeking to project power into frontiers 
newly designated for cultural transformation and economic development. Tocqueville, until he died in 1859, grappled with the contradictions of emergent democracy, which implied human equality, and territorial expansion in both America and France, which, which implied subordination of non-Europeans. Perhaps latent in his famous Democracy in America, Tocqueville wrote about Algeria, making clear his sense that he wanted to avoid what he sensed in America, the mediocrity of democratic individualism. Such mediocrity could be accomplished by state actions calling French people to a sense of national greatness through colonization. And you can read Tocqueville's writings to understand his struggle between um, liberal, his, 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 uh, his understanding of, his appreciation of liberal democracy and his, his, his sense that France needed to expand territorially to preserve its, uh, its power and its capacity for public virtue. After the American Civil War, French commentators continued to look to an American example for development of territory distant from the metropolis by a loyal and culturally unified population. As Tocqueville had written before the American Civil War, a scholar of the history of colonialism in the 1870s, Leroy Bellieu, wrote an article, for example, called Colonization Compared in Algeria and the United States. In this article, this French commentator lamented the low rate of European settlement in Algeria, where the French had been in Algeria for more than half a century. Only a quarter of a million settlers had crossed the Mediterranean. For successful Algerian colonization, two, two conditions seem required, which are not yet met, that Roy Bellieu observed. In America, if one wants to benefit from the law known as homestead, that person is guaranteed property by paying a moderate price of 16 francs per hectare. Such a policy was needed in Algeria to overturn the philanthropic but very chimerical policy of Napoleon III in establishing an Arab reservation. The second policy necessary, according to this French commentator, would consist of a political organization of Algeria creating a notable independence of the management of its business contrary to the spirit of absolute centralization which characterizes French administration. This paper really cannot fully explore, of course, uh, the extent to which American territorial settlement policy was shaped by envy of French abolitionism and fear of French communism, as I noted, nor can it explore the full extent, of course, of French Algerian policies in the way they were shaped by, the re by revulsion at the fate of Native Americans and admiration of American territorial homestead law. Um, yet, these, these, are, these are questions that are all well worth investigation of the mutual influence of the two Republican empires in their projects for state building in the middle decades of the 19th century. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending our panel. My talk uh, this afternoon is entitled All Hail Public Opinion, American Abolitionists on British Liberalism and the Repeal of the Corn Laws. And perhaps at the outset, I should say something about what the Corn Laws were, in case you don't know. Uh, here in Houston, we have a sort of unwritten corn law, which is that if you go to a Tex-Mex restaurant, you should get a free basket of corn tortilla chips. So I'm just letting you know that when you go out to dinner tonight, you are entitled to that. Um, but the corn laws, of course, that I'm talking about uh, were protectionist trade policies that were instituted by the British state in the early 19th century to protect the agricultural food supply uh, of Britain. And in the mid-19th century, beginning well, really throughout the early 19th century, but beginning especially with the formation of the Anti-Corn Law League in 1839, a variety of British liberals and also working class radicals together rallied for the repeal of these laws. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. National anniversaries like the sesquicentennial of the Civil War 
have a tendency to turn our focus inward and draw attention to iconic Americans like Abraham Lincoln or the abolitionists Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips. But it's important to remember that 150 years ago, the attention of these figures was often turned outwards towards the world. The icons whom many of the iconic Americans of the Civil War era admired, the heroes of our national heroes, if you will, were often non-Americans. In his famous Peoria speech, for example, Lincoln identified his cause with that of a liberal party throughout the world, not just the nation. And after Lincoln was assassinated barely a decade later, one of the things discovered among his personal effects was a folded copy of a speech by British liberal and corn law repealer John Bright. Bright had first gained international fame as a leader of the Anti-Corn Law League, whose other founding leader, Richard Cobden, also became an internationally renowned figure in the 1840s. Many of Lincoln's contemporaries were also admirers of Bright and Cobden, including the group I know best and would like to talk about today, the American abolitionists. Wendell Phillips, for example, described Cobden to a British friend as, quote, a man I much long to see. And in 1846, when Cobden and Bright achieved the victory for which they became most famous, the repeal of the Corn Laws, Phillips wrote to another transatlantic friend, quote, how I clap my hands at their success and wish I could have heard and seen Cobden and Bright. Now the testimonies of contemporary reformers like Lincoln and Phillips remind us that in the antebellum years, Cobden was far better known as an international icon and more widely admired than either Phillips or Lincoln. Indeed, one testament to the wide-ranging international influence and appeal of Cobden, Bright, and their league is the fact that American abolitionists, a notoriously uh, vociferous group that was divided after 1840 into a bewildering array of, of factions, almost all united in admiring the Anti-Corn Law League. So in my remarks today, I'd like to make two main points. First of all, like Phillips, as I've said, abolitionists across factional lines clapped their hands at the League's success in 1846. And despite their disagreements on many subjects, abolitionists united in admiring the British liberals who advocated corn law repeal. And the second point I'd like to make is that a major reason for this widespread admiration among abolitionists was the popular understanding that corn law repeal had demonstrated the power of public opinion, in the phrase they often cited, and organized agitation to defeat entrenched aristocratic power. And I'll close by suggesting some of the implications of those two main points. Now, I should immediately qualify my first point about the widespread admiration for corn law repealers among American abolitionists by noting at the outset that many abolitionists especially the Garrisonian radicals in the American Anti-Slavery Society, of which Phillips was a prominent member, found fault with Cobden and League on a variety of particular points. Abolitionists often harshly criticized Cobden for his cordial correspondence with American pro-slavery free traders like John Calhoun, for example. But even when we take into account uh, their criticisms, it's clear that across the well-known factional lines that divided them, American abolitionists generally praised the tactics of the League and credited it with victory when the Corn Laws were repealed. Now the fact that abolitionists were admirers of Corn Law repealers was partly a cause and partly an effect of the fact that abolitionists were also frequently acquainted personally with Leaguers thanks to dense interpersonal ties of travel, acquaintance, and correspondence. Dozens of American abolitionists had attended world's conventions on anti-slavery in London in 1840 and 1843 at the height of the League's activities. And during the decades following, they forged numerous transatlantic friendships. <clears throat> Many of the British abolitionists, whom American abolitionists came to know most intimately in the 1840s, were active supporters of the Anti-Corn Law League. To give the most prominent example, George Thompson, in addition to being the leading supporter of Garrisonian abolitionism in Great Britain, was also employed by the League as one of its most prominent national lecturers. Many American abolitionists traveling to Britain in the 1840s uh, attended League meetings. They met with Leaguers and they sometimes even lodged with them. Because of its innovative attempts to mobilize the support of women, the League also counted among its supporters many British women who were closely affiliated with American abolitionist women. Uh, 
For example, some of the British women who helped organize the Anti-Corn Law League's two famous fundraising and propaganda bazaars in Manchester and Covent Garden had a long and ongoing history of supporting the anti-slavery fairs of American women in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, and sometimes even passed surplus items from the League's bazaars to the United States for sale by abolitionists. So, uh, and I could talk more about this, but there were dense ties connecting American abolitionists with, with leaguers, and that helps explain why they cheered the, the League's success in 1846. They knew the people who were involved in the campaign. But the second point I'd like to make concerns the question of why. Why did admiration for and connections to the League among American abolitionists often cut across factions within the anti-slavery movement? And the main point I'd like to make here is that the economic liberalism of the League, its identification with the doctrine of free trade, does not tell the full story of why American abolitionists admired the League. Both within and across factional lines, American abolitionists were not at all of one mind about the wisdom of total free trade. And even those who were free traders were not always so for economic reasons. Some American abolitionists, it's true, favored total free trade because they believed it would undermine slave produce, even to the point of agreeing with Cobden that Parliament should abolish the sugar duties, protecting the post-emancipation economies of the British West Indies. But others disagreed. Uh, and others were attracted more to the potential of free trade to do other things, like foster international peace or solve immediate food supply problems uh, faced particularly by the working classes in the British Isles, than they were to classic economic arguments for free trade. And other historians have shown that uh, the lack of consensus about economic liberalism and its relationships to anti-slavery principles is one of the things that prevented abolitionists and uh, Corn Law Leaguers in Britain from forming any, any uh, strong organizational alliances between them, despite the multifarious interpersonal ties among them. So it wasn't just economic liberalism that drew abolitionists to the Anti-Corn Law League, but there was another side of the Corn Law Repeal Movement that could garner the applause of abolitionists, despite such disagreements namely its reputation as a model of how peaceful agitation could change highly entrenched laws and institutions. Abolitionists, like many contemporaries, were captivated by the League's story of gradual expansion from a small Manchester-based lobby to a national organization whose lectures, thousands of publications, and political tactics seemed in less than a decade to have bent uh, a hostile government to its will. Now, recent historians have shown that that story of the League's uh, ascendancy and triumph is riddled with, with problems uh, in retrospect. But for their own reasons, both Leaguers and political leaders like Prime Minister Robert Peel skillfully promoted the idea that Corn Law Repeal was a case in which the voice of the British people had spoken through the League and the government had responded. Whatever the realities, that myth, the myth of the League, spread far and wide before and after 1846. As one recent historian notes, the Anti-Corn Law League came to be seen in Victorian England as the archetype of agitation aimed at convincing public opinion. And this reputation soon spread far beyond England as well. When Cobden, for example, made a continental tour of Europe in 1847, he received a hero's welcome from continental European liberals who also used the League's myth as a model for how they might use public opinion to challenge their own rulers. After 1846, American abolitionists in various factions did the same thing. They also embraced the myth of the League, turning to it to vindicate their favored strategies for opposing the slave power in the United States. In 1852, for example, Thomas Wentworth Higginson used the example of the Anti-Corn Law League to reply to, quote, short-sighted men who complain of third parties like the Free Soil Party. Writing in support of the election of Free Soil candidates, Higginson argued that, quote, all history shows that it is the third parties which have done the work of the world. The anti-corn law party in England was a third party, he said, but it had abolished the corn laws and controlled England, and we are trying to profit by their example. In turn, Garrisonian abolitionists turned to the Anti-Corn Law League to defend their own position, which at that moment was that abolitionists should not form third parties or vote. Um, 
these uh, Garrisonian leaders in the American Anti-Slavery Society believed that abolitionists should rely solely on tactics of agitation, like speeches and newspapers. But a Garrisonian abolitionist, in defense of that policy, pointed, just as Higginson had done, to the Anti-Corn Law League. They emphasized the League's heavy reliance on tactics much like their own, speeches, print, large public meetings for discussing the Corn Laws. And American and British abolitionists who knew the Garrisonians often reported that their up-close observations of the League revealed many similarities to the American Anti-Slavery Society and its methods. For example, James Buffum reported to Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator, that an anti-corn law meeting he had attended, quote, reminded me of one of our New England conventions. And Garrisonians also noticed the close resemblances between the anti-slavery fairs organized annually by Garrisonian women in the United States and the two massive free trade bazaars organized by corn law repealers. Perhaps the staunchest and most sophisticated defender of Garrisonian strategy was Wendell Phillips. And in a sequence of speeches on public opinion and the philosophy of the abolition movement delivered in 1852 and 1853, Phillips also pointed to British liberalism to defend Garrisonian abolitionism. All hail public opinion, Phillips declared in the first of these speeches. In such an age as ours, he argued, the so-called statesman has far less influence than the many little men who at various <laughs> points are silently maturing a regeneration of public opinion. And it shouldn't surprise you that Phillips, as evidence, then pointed to the leaders of popular movements in Great Britain for the last 50 years, including the Corn Law Repealers. Let me close by alluding to some of the implications of these two points I've briefly sketched, that abolitionists admired the League across factions in their movement, and that they often did so as much for its apparent political achievements as its economic principles. First of all, I'd argue and could elaborate on the reasons why I think that tracing out the uses that American abolitionists made of corn law repeal help us understand the divided abolitionist movement, and particularly the place of Garrisonians and, and uh, like Phillips within it, <coughs> quite differently. But to return to my opening comments about the need for American historians of the Civil War to look beyond the nation, just as Civil War Americans did. The points I've shared today indicate that Civil War era Americans, like the abolitionists, instead of looking only inward at the political convulsions caused by the impending crisis at home, uh, were in many ways still caught up in the gravitational pull of British liberalism and its wide-ranging influence, which reached across the English Channel as well as across the Atlantic. So one of the main conclusions we might draw from this is confirmation that while antebellum Americans struggled over the fate of their national union, they still largely lived, as historian Sam Haynes has recently argued, in a predominantly British world. Thanks. Well, I'm originally from Italy. And uh, I wish I could tell you that if you go to Italy, you are entitled to free pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm afraid I cannot. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> in recent years, thanks especially to the work of transnational scholars, such as Thomas Bender, Ian Tyrrell, and Carl Guarneri, the American Civil War has conquered its own place in the ever-growing literature on 19th century nation building in the Euro-American world. Yet, as early as the 1960s, David Potter had already claimed that the main contributions of the American Civil War to 19th century world history and the two features that made it a unique case study for historical comparison were that it turned the tide which had been running against nationalism for 40 years and that it forged the bond between nationalism and liberalism at a time when it appeared that the two might draw apart and move in opposite directions after the defeat of the 1848 European revolutions. Potter refers specifically to the ideology represented by Lincoln and the Republican Party as a high tide of a type of liberal nationalism with a great deal in common with mid-19th century European liberal nationalist movements. 
And significantly, within that European context, the most celebrated of such movements was the one for Italian national unification, the Risorgimento, which resulted in a victory of liberal <laughs> principles with the creation of an Italian constitutional monarchy. That happened in 17th March, 1861. I want to point this out because today, as we speak, uh, Italy has a national holiday, and they are celebrating right now the 150 years from that event. <coughs> Thus, we can say that from David Potter's perspective, the Risorgimento would have made an ideal case study for comparison with the American Civil War. So with this paper, I intend to illustrate a possible comparative project on the American Civil War and Italian national unification as the two foremost examples of the victory of mid-19th century progressive nationalist principles, principles related particularly to the ideas of economic development, individual liberty, and political representation. And I intend to do so by focusing specifically on Abraham Lincoln and Camillo Cavour, since they were the two main ideologues behind the two movements that resulted in the achievement of national unification of a sort. In the midst of the American Civil War and the Italian Risorgimento, Lincoln and Cavour faced national crises on comparable magnitude, crises that they themselves contributed in creating and that they themselves brought to completion leaving the nations that emerged from these trials permanently marked with unmistakable blueprints. Such blueprints consisted in both cases of two main elements, the belief in a strong connection between economic development and socio-political progress as the ins indispensable factor that ensured equal opportunities to the nation's citizens and the indissolubility of the tie between nationality and parliamentary representation as the most important guarantee of civil liberties enjoyed by both, by both individuals and institutions. In general, Lincoln and Cavour shared a common belief in the importance of economic development and in its direct link to social and political progress. It was in both cases the direct experience of the effects of economic transformation related in one case to the market revolution, and in the other case to proto-industrialization in areas at the periphery of the world economy, such as Illinois and Piedmont, that convinced Lincoln and Cavour of the fact that economic progress was an indispensable factor in connecting together the different parts of a nation, and also in linking the latter to the world at large. In joining the Whigs as early as 1832, Lincoln sought to support the party's program of internal improvements through the construction of a widespread and integrated transportation system in conjunction with a centralized bank and with the adoption of protected tariffs for American manufacturers. Lincoln joined his conviction of the necessity of a systematic program for national economic progress with a strong belief in the principles of liberty and equality set in the Declaration of Independence. Thus, by the time he joined the Republican Party in 1856, according to Peter Parrish, Lincoln had espoused the kind of ameliorative nationalism, in which, these are Peter Parrish's words, the aim of improvement was directed at individuals, the nation, economic advancement, and social and moral development. Significantly, that economic development played an indispensable role in a nation's path to progress was also Cavour be Cavour's belief. Yet, unlike Lincoln, Cavour was strictly anti-protectionist and convinced that freedom of trade would have allowed competition and therefore improvement in both industry and agriculture. As Luciano Cafagna is noted, Cavour intended freedom as a liberation of positive energies achieved through the construction of a sound economy and also through the exercise of constitutional rights or representation in an elected parliament. There is little doubt that in their ideas on the constituent elements of economic progress on a national scale, Lincoln and Cavour were close 
There are different views on protectionism, though, betrayed the influence of opposite types of economic cultures. Also, both Lincoln's and Cavour's ideas of progress combine economic development with sociopolitical advancement in the context of comparable programs of national improvement. In the 1850s, the United States and Italy were profoundly divided societies in ideological and political terms. In both cases, a national question dominated the thoughts and actions of the most prominent intellectuals and politicians. In the United States, the divisive issue was slavery, while in Italy, the national question focused on bringing the country together by freeing it from foreign oppression at the same time. Lincoln's and Cavour's ideas for resolving the two national questions stem from their convictions on the benefits of economic progress, but had at their core an unwavering belief in individual liberty and political representation. Lincoln made an unmistakable stand against slavery during the 1858 campaign for the Illinois seat in the Senate by arguing that slavery was a major threat to both liberty and republicanism. As David Erickson has pointed out, Lincoln went as far as assimilating slavery to royal absolutism, talking about the struggle <coughs> between the common rights of humanity and the divine rights of kings, an analogy that would have easily connected in the minds of the listeners is anti-slavery positions with Europe's liberal nationalist movements. <coughs> Proceeding from these principles, Lincoln created a truly nationalist anti-slavery ideology by highlighting the absolute commitment to the preservation of the Union, particularly in his 1858 House Divided speech. In it, Lincoln pointed the way to the resolution of the U.S. national question by envisioning what can be described as a process of a future unification with liberal principles at its core between the free and the slave parts of the country. In Italy, Cavour quickly emerged as the driving force behind the Piedmontese kingdoms of Sardinia's economic and political modernization. By 1857, groups of Italian nationalists <coughs> affiliated to Cavour had founded the National Society, a political organization, as Stuart Wolf has written, self-consciously liberal, that looked to the educated middle classes, the industrialists, the traders, the landowners, rejecting both aristocratic claims to social privilege and the threat implicit in an appeal to the masses. Cavour emerged as the natural leader of this group of liberal nationalists committed to Italian unification because he showed his own commitment both to the principle of self-determination and to the formation of that very best form of government, which to him was a constitutional monarchy modeled after the Piedmontese one and based on parliamentary representation. Thus, in both Lincoln's and Cavour's cases, the interpretations of the meaning of liberty was at the heart of a program of national regeneration, a program to be achieved for a process that involved the composition of sociopolitical fractures through unification of a sort. In light of the existence of such comparable elements in the economic and political backgrounds, the problems that Lincoln faced in 1861-65 and that Cavour faced in 1859-61 when they embarked on their respective political military revolutions, resolutions, sorry, of America's and Italy's national questions, and the actions that the two statesmen took may seem broadly comparable. In both cases, the resolution of the national question involved decisive steps towards the consolidation of a divided country into a national unity through war and military conquest. Also, in both cases, such action was the final stage in a long process of nation building, a stage that contemplated the creation of a new national identity modeled after the liberal institutions of the polity, the Union in one case, Piedmont in the other case, that had promoted national unification. During the Civil War, as Melinda Lawson has noted, Lincoln asked his countrymen's allegiance to a nation, the Union, that was to be, as she said, strong and beneficent, bestowing economic well-being and guaranteeing liberty to its people. 
Thus, in Lincoln's inclusive definition of nationalism, one strongly influenced by radical republicans by 1862, the government's strong central authority was to be guarantor not only of the nation state's legitimacy, but also the protection of the basic civil liberties for all its citizens, both white and black, particularly after the release of the 1st of January 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. Similarly to Lincoln, during the events that led to the Italian national unification, Cavour reasserted his absolute commitment to the liberal principles. And even after unification was achieved, he did so particularly through his staunch support of the safeguard not only of basic liberties, but also of local freedom and regional autonomy through decentralization in the debates over the new Italian administrative system. At the same time, though, the principle of inclusiveness in Lincoln's nationalism proved absent in Cavour's attitude toward the collectivity of the Italian people, particularly since Cavour could not help but think that the Italian South and its people were inherently backward in comparison with the North. Conclusion. Neither Lincoln nor Cavour lived to be able to guide their newly unified nations in their first difficult years of existence. Lincoln was murdered on the 15th of April of 1865, while Cavour had already died of fever on the 6th of June, 1861. Arguably, the liberal principles at the heart of Lincoln's and Cavour's concepts of nationalism left very different legacies. Lincoln in Lincoln's inclusive vision of a United States in which both whites and blacks would have eventually enjoyed equal civil rights had a dramatic confirmation in the legal measures taken by the radical Republican dominated Congress during the period of Congressional Reconstruction. Conversely, Cavour's exclusive vision of the Italian nation, one that owed much to his inability to understand the particular conditions of the South, acted as an ideological background to the liberal Italian government's repression of a large-scale rebellion of southern peasants called Great Brigantage an event which is now increasingly interpreted by historians as Italy's first civil war, and also significantly an event that spanned the years 1861-1865. Thank you. Thank you um, to our panelists for um, these very, I think, stimulating and provocative papers. Um, and I should say before we get started that while we're celebrating anniversaries and holidays, sesquicentennials, I would be remiss, one of us would be remiss not to point out that it's also the notoriously transatlantic holiday of St. Patrick's Day um, as well. So probably celebrated more, more on this side of the Atlantic than that side. Um, although Enrico can tell us more about that. And maybe Caleb could tell us a good place to get a free pint of Guinness or shot of Jameson's after the panel. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I, I'm sure that there are lots of questions, so I'm going to try to just group my comments into um, really just three broad topics is what I want to do. First, uh, I have um, sort of there's a methodological piece, a substantive piece, and then a kind of implications piece. Um, so uh, in terms of methodology, I'd like to think about the different approaches to writing American history from a transatlantic perspective that the three papers model, because I think they're doing some different things that are worth flagging. Um, second, I'd like to move into the substance of the arguments, think about what they tell us collectively about the historical meanings of 19th century liberalism. Uh, and then finally, uh, when I move to thinking about the implications going forward, what we're supposed to, you know, how we think about all this collectively, um, one of the things that I, I think the papers do suggest is some maybe possibilities to rethink periodization, how we periodize the 19th century that might be helpful to think about. So to start with uh, the different models here. Um, I think collectively the papers demonstrate that situating American history within a transatlantic context uh, is a, a versatile and multidimensional endeavor. There's no one right way to do it, uh, which probably explains why historians have been so attracted to it in recent decades, because uh, there's you know, lots, of, lots of different strategies to, to sort of employ there. Um, I just want to make a couple of distinctions, because I, I think they, they are interesting just to, to point out and to, think of, to be mindful about how we do it. Um, one is drawing out the connections, the transatlantic connections that the historical actors at the time were aware of, 
or, you know, were, were part of and would have would recognize if we if they were sitting here today. And then the other, you know, is to think about those connections that we can draw out that they would not have seen. And I think they're both really important to do. We're certainly not bound by how our historical actors perceive their own world. Because we know that America did not live in isolation from the rest of the world, but instead through networks of trade, uh, government, diplomacy, culture, we're embedded in this whole series of very thick global connections. And so it's our job as historians to kind of follow those up, discover them sometimes, follow them, trace them, um, and again, whether or not the people we study would have, would have seen that. Um, although I do think it's helpful to think about which one you're doing as you're doing it. So with that very crude distinction in mind, I, you know, to, to, to think about the three papers, to my mind, um, Caleb McDaniel seems to be offering a kind of transnational and connected history. Um, Enrico Delago is engaged in a kind of parallel and comparative history. And Timothy Roberts is writing, I think, a comparative account with suggestions of transnational mutual influences, as he put it. And you'll know that I'm actually discussing the, the papers in chronological order um, rather than programmatic order. Um, so to think about what I mean by those different distinctions, McDaniel's paper shows the centrality of the Anti-Corn Law League to how American abolitionists conceived of their own efforts. Abolitionists and Corn Law repealers, and I, and I would say the, the influences went both ways, right, because the Corn Law Leaguers were actually looking to the model of British abolition as well. Um, but they were connected at the time through, as, as Caleb says, very dense networks of travel, acquaintance, correspondence, and print. Uh, and they borrowed and drew sustenance from one another around the efficacy of this, this reform strategy. Um, indeed, so important was the Anti-Corn Law League, and especially its leader, Richard Cobden, one of its leaders, to American abolitionists that McDaniel suggests that Americans in the 1850s might have believed they were living in the age of Cobden, uh, rather than what historians would like to look back retroactively at and consider maybe the age of Garrison or the age of Phillips or the age of Lincoln. Uh, in this way, the transnational connected approach that McDaniel, McDaniel employs is clearly rooted in the world those American abolitionists themselves inhabited and perceived. Uh, and I think the, the benefit of that work is that it, it, it really enriches and, and often alters our understanding of the 19th century Americans by reminding us just how transatlantic and transnational they themselves were, um, leading us actually to discover sometimes that this new fangled thing we call transatlantic history is of course nothing new whatsoever, but something they knew at the time as well. Enrico Delago, by contrast, offers us what I would see as a parallel or comparative history of Cavour and Lincoln as two successful champions of uh, liberal nationalist unification in the 1860s. He demonstrates the similarity of the Italian and American statesmen's political outlook, liberal, progressive, uh, moderate, modernizing, um, as well as the comparable challenges they faced in the crisis of the Risorgimento in the American Civil War. Cavour and Lincoln did not know each other, um, and Cavour, in fact, as Enrico says, died just a couple of months after Lincoln was inaugurated. Uh, so it's not a story of direct influence and connection, but instead it reveals these parallel and roughly analogous processes. And in so doing, again, the, the great benefit of this kind of work, I think, is that it helps us to see, as, as good comparative history should, what we might not be able to see absent that parallel. We learn how... Um, their, their experiences, Lincoln and Cavour's experiences, living in um, a part of, part of the world that's kind of peripheral to, peripheral to the world economy, either Illinois or Piedmont, um, shaped their political and economic views and, and the insistence they placed on economic development. Uh, and also putting those, the two versions of liberal nationalism side by side, um, I think helps throws into relief the democratic thrust of Lincoln's own liberal nationalism. Finally, Timothy Roberts presents something of a hybrid, I think. Uh, that is, um, it's a comparative history of the French, uh, third, third, France and the Third Republic um, and the United States in the Civil War era with aspirations to a transnational connected history. He shows us the similarities as well as the very important differences between the expansionist policies of the newly consolidated United States um, and of, of Third Republic France. Um, and he also, he reaches for some very intriguing um, evidence of mutual influence and cross-pollination. Cross um, there's a few very rich tantalizing hints there, I think, um, but it's, it's not entirely clear how much Americans and French saw their expansionist, territorial expansionist pro projects as twinned uh, in this way. Though it's entirely possible, I think, the Tocqueville um, line of inquiry is a, is a really good one, especially because Tocqueville not only you know, writes extensively on Algeria, but comments quite a bit on uh, American treatment of Native Americans as well. <laughs>
Um, but as comparative history, Robert's paper makes us see familiar events in new ways as well. Native American historians and historians of the American West have pointed out the simultaneity and continuity of the Union fighting the Confederates in the South and uh, Indians in the West, but Robert's comparative analysis of the American Plains and French Algeria highlights the larger historical processes that are at work and raises some, I think, important questions about correlation and causation. Uh, particularly, in, and I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later, but forcing us to really ask what is the relationship between these processes, uh, between the celebration of what he terms the inclusionary and even exceptional civil liberty on the one hand, uh, and, the, and in his words, the racialized ordering of national imperial borders on the other hand. Um, you know, what, what is it about those two processes that makes France and the United States, in, in Robert's words, exemplars of Atlantic empire building? Uh, so then just to move to thinking about what the papers tell us about the historical meanings of, of liberalism. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting is that they are all treating liberalism, not always explicitly s s doing it, but treat treating it as a very uh, international phenomenon in the same way that we would think of um, capitalism or nationalism, abolitionism, all, all those, those big isms that really transcended national borders. Uh, there has been a, um, a tendency in the late 20th century, I think, to associate 19th century liberalism, especially its European variant, with uh, free trade, uh, laissez-faire economics, you know, unfettered markets, self-possessed individuals, um, a rising bourgeoisie. Um, and these three papers clearly show that liberalism in the 19th century was much more capacious and much more varied than, than that caricature has, has uh, led us to believe. Uh, Caleb McDaniel helpfully shows us that even in the seemingly clearest instance of laissez-faire economic liberalism, right, the successful struggle against the protectionist uh, Corn Law Leagues in Britain in 1846, even then, the significance for American observers was much more about the political mobilization it sparked rather than economic freedom in any way. Abolitionists did not even agree on the wisdom of dogmatic free trade, um, especially if it threatened to subordinate any slavery goals. Uh, but as he argues, Garrisonian and non-Garrisonian alike celebrated the Anti-Corn Law League's efforts as a successful model of peaceful agitation that appealed directly to a public opinion rather than to elected officials and was seen as a distinctively liberal mode of reform. Uh, this strategy, meeting in conventions, holding fairs or bazaars, giving endless speeches and printing endless uh, documents, um, was really central to what, the British, uh, to what in the British case was termed pressure from without outside the, the electoral system. And recovering the abolitionist enthusiasm for the Anti-Corn Law League uh, allows McDaniel to highlight the deliberate extra-electoral political strategy of the Garrisonians, thus muting some of the distinctions of the Garrisonian, non-Garrisonian split around questions of political strategy. Um, I might push him in the questions and answers to actually think about the differences there too in this uh, connected history. What about the comparative piece? Because it seems like thinking about extra-electoral political activity would look very different in, in um, the UK, where before 1867 there's very, very minimal um, suffrage, and in the United States where you have white manhood suffrage. Um, but in McDaniel's hands, the Garrisonians come across as less concerned with a sort of purity-preserving come outerism that they sometimes rhetorically adopted, and more savvy about you know, understanding that talking, in Phillips's words, was actually doing. There, there was a connected in a way. And that's, I should say, also something that slaveholders would certainly come to agree with, right, by 1860. Um, Enrico de Lago clearly focuses on economic development, but he also, I think, subordinates the precise characteristics of that classical laissez-faire liberalism to a, a sort of larger nationalizing, modernizing liberal worldview. Um, both, um, you know, both Lincoln and Cavour had economic development as central to social and political progress. Um, but as he shows, the, the nationalizing plans of Lincoln harkened back to the protectionism of a Henry Clay, while Cavour adopted the Cobdenite program, the Cobdenite mantra of free trade. So what united these two men as liberal statesmen par excellence, uh, Del Lago suggests, was what he terms their unwavering belief in individual liberty and political representation, and especially the centrality of the nation in guaranteeing uh, civil and political liberty. Um, so broad political interpretations of the meaning of liberty critically informed both men's notions of national regeneration through unification. If these programs were not identical in practice, so too did they leave different legacies for the United States and Italy. 
Del Lago hints near the end of his paper with these dark, ominous references toward Cavour's exclusionist, uh, elitist attitudes toward southern Italy uh, at the limitations of liberalism, and the limitations of liberal nationalism uh, in both Italy and the United States. Such limitations are, of course, more explicitly addressed in Robert's exploration of the darker side of what he terms transnational liberal progress. Americans and French um, linked such progress not only with emancipation, but with territorial expansion and the, the accompanying dispossession of indigenous peoples. Uh, and in this case, actually, one of the things that struck me about Robert's paper, too, is in the American case, how much the liberals there seem to be, um, liberalism seems to be defined by its enemies. And so territorial expansion, because it's opposed by the slaveholders, that becomes part and parcel of the progressive liberal program um, in a way that might not have occurred absent that opposition. France um, encouraged settlement in Algeria through economic and political incentives that called to mind the Republican Party's 1862 Homestead Act. But both nationalist projects, Roberts demonstrates, relied on feeding the land hunger of citizens through similarly hard forms of racial exclusion. That it was the same liberal nation, this sort of you know, triumph of the liberal nation that granted the freedmen citizenship while securing the Great Plains for white settlement gives us a sense, I think, of some of the contradictions and difficulties at the heart of liberalism. McDaniel is most explicit about the particular importance of British liberalism whose wide-ranging influence exerted what he terms a gravitational pull that reached across the channel as well as across the Atlantic throughout the 19th century. And while the example um, of liberal Britain, I think, hovers over both De Lago's and Robert's papers as well, the singular importance might be more fully developed in, perhaps, in questions. In the case of Cavour's liberalism, for instance, the central importance of Manchester School economics was established during Cobden's Continental Tour of 1847, when Cobden and Cavour actually met. Um, this is, this is the, the one degree of, of Cobden part of the paper. Um, unlike many of the abolitionist McDaniel studies, as well as unlike Abraham Lincoln, Cavour followed Cobden's economic programs, uh, principles to the letters in ways that deeply implicated his elaboration of modern nationalism. British liberalism, I think, may also have a role to play in Robert's interpretation, and not just because Cobden spent secession winter in Algeria, recovering from bad health. Um, that's, that's the other one degree of, of Cobden. Got to cut tight all together. Um, but I am, I'm very intrigued by Robert's tentative findings on mutual influence or twinning of a t territorial expansionist projects between France and the United States. Um, in light of recent work of, of John Weaver um, and James Belish, I, I have to wonder whether the French were not indebted to the rich British discussion of settler colonialism in South Australia, New Zealand, and Canada right around this time, right at mid-century. Edward Gibbon Wakefield's 19, uh, sorry, 1849, A View of the Art of Colonization, really systematized for, for the British thinking about colonies as safety valves and as part of a much larger patriotic nationalist imperialist project. Uh, Wakefield also urged the major reform of parceling out smaller chunks of land, smaller plots of land to us to encourage the kind of yeoman farmers um, that the Algerian Plains uh, situations were also doing. Um, and this volume also, Wakefield's volume, notably includes a discussion of Algeria, right, in 49. So that's a little, another interesting connection with British liberalism. So maybe it is the British century. Um, 19, 19, the gravitational pull, I think, is, is even more vast maybe than, than we realized. Uh, and then finally, the implications question, or the so what question, or you know, how do these new ways of seeing American transatlantic history, um, understanding the power, the durability, uh, the contradictions, the mutability of liberalism, make us think differently about the 19th century? And I think, um, especially as I, as I said in, in the beginning, I think they, they, it might be a moment to, at least uh, for conceptual purposes, to, to rethink our periodization somewhat. Uh, and this, I think, seems to be one of the interesting contributions of either transnational or comparative or global approaches to history is the sort of relative <coughs> decline in the salience of terms like age of Jackson history or you know, Jacksonian history or um, antebellum history. But instead, if you're, if you're working across national borders, you have to look at sort of bigger rubrics, right? The era of national liberation, the, the age of empire, whatever it is. Um, in American history, I think McDaniel's uh, focus on the Britishness, the sort of enduring gravitational pull of Britain, um, does some interesting things for us. I think it you know, maybe suggests we might want to think of the Civil War as the end point or culmination of a century-long process of national liberation and consolidation that, of course, begins in the 18th century, right? It begins with the Stamp Act, maybe in 1765, that it's 
you know, rather than being its own sort of separate era, is it sort of the end of something that has come before it for, for many, many decades. Um, another sort of way we can think about periodization is the way Enrico Del Lago uses David Potter, uh, David Potter's idea of the 1860s as being this crucial moment for the triumph of liberal nationalism after the false starts and failures of 1848. Um, though as his paper, I think, suggests, uh, and, and Robert's paper certainly argues, it's a short-lived moment. Um, nicely captured by the fact that Cavour and Lincoln, as he says, would barely live to celebrate it, right? It's, it's over before, you know, it, and, and also Cobden himself dies in 1865, so there's an end of an era there as well. Um, but I think Robert's question asks us to rethink this periodization in a couple of different ways. Um, by tracking the suddenness of that move from liberal nationalism to what might seem its illiberal variation, or from an era of liberal nationalism to an era of the illiberal nation state. And there are you know, different, I think different scholars working in different traditions have thought about this um, apart from the American context. But you know, move from the kind of romantic liberal um, nationalist movements of the 19th century, unification projects that are, you know, have a relative inclusiveness and uh, to a harder uh, exclusionist, imperialist nationalist projects that we tend to associate with the late 19th century. Um, I think Hobsbawm in his work notes 1870 as sort of a turning point from the era of nationalism to the age of empire. Um, Brian Porter, who is a historian of Polish nationalism, also talks about when nationalism began to hate as a way of sort of thinking of this move. Um, so you know, this, I think the suddenness, the simultaneity of it does raise some questions. Um, and, and it raises questions not just about how we draw the periods, but how we connect them. Is there causation or correlation here? And C.A. Bailey in his Birth of the Modern World really sees this, this period of conflicts over national movements and then these conflicts over land wars as being causally related, that the one gives rise to the other. The, the sort of projects of, of unifying and consolidating nations then sparks this, this move, this land hunger move. And I'm wondering then how we might think about the, the Great Plains in Algeria, um, how we might put those in conversation with, say, Anglo-Maori conflict in New Zealand, or um, Co Co the Koso and Zulu Wars in Southern Africa. These are all sort of sparked over uh, white pe European settlers' hunger for land and the conflict they're going to have with non-Europeans. Non um, and, and even then to think about the move from liberal nationalism to illiberal statehood, if that's helpful, uh, we might even think just in the, in the American case, the clear narrowing that we see in the meaning of liberalism. And from what, at least from uh, Caleb McDaniel's work and Enrico de Lago's work, uh, you know, how Lincoln and how the Garrisonians are thinking about liberalism certainly seems to disappear fairly quickly. Um, Thomas Bender has argued elsewhere that even something like Americans going to Germany to study law and political theory uh, were being taught a really different theory of rights um, than Lincoln held or the Garrisonians held um, or that liberalism that earlier, earlier part of the century presupposes. Instead of assuming a rights-bearing rights individual, right, you're sort of born with that, instead a sense uh, in the, from the German legal and political tradition that states granted rights. Rights came from states. They didn't adhere in, in, in the individual. And that will be promoted to great effect in the United States by um, many scholars. And of course, we see that that is what we see happen to the 14th Amendment, right? Is this kind of state control over what the rights mean. It's, not, it's no longer Congress. It's no longer voters that are going to decide through Slaughterhouse and even the sort of um, early women's suffrage cases of Minor v. Hafferset. Um, it's going to be the judiciary. It's going to be the state that determines this, not, not voters themselves. Uh, then finally, I'm just going to throw out the question um, in a sort of a bit of devil's advocacy, which is that uh, well, the panelists and, and myself included all seem to agree, I think, on the benefits of writing history from a transatlantic perspective, um, either comparative, connected, parallel, however you want to call it. Uh, I, I wonder if we might think at all if there are costs, too, or what those costs are. Um, as we all sort of chase these expanded frames um, of, in connected histories, are there processes we're distorting or less overtly just simply lines of analysis that we're not following? It's sort of an opportunity cost there. Um, and do our panelists think it's the case that once you've gone transatlantic or global or comparative, you never go back? Or uh, might we expect to see a reassertion of more clearly national history in the future? And I'll open it for questions. Okay.
I look at the recent emphasis on transnational history as a, a way of kind of getting back to a more traditional focus on elites. Um, so especially in the first two papers, we hear discussion of kind of transnational awareness and transnational engagement, but it seemed to only go so far down the social strata. Um, so I don't know how to pose this exactly as a question, but how far in your specific studies, I guess, do you see transnational awareness and transnational engagement kind of seeping into the, the wider polity? Um, and maybe I'd like to pose that something that we might lose with the transnational focus is we end up studying just a few cosmopolitan elites. That's a really good question, and I think it is something that, uh, you know, the transnational turn, people who are kind of getting on that bandwagon need to be really sensitive to because the risk is you go back to kind of writing traditional intellectual history among people who have the power to publish what they write and so forth. So social history uh, that since the 1960s has, you know, tried to destroy that paradigm and tried to get us to write about ordinary people. Um, I think in my own work, uh, I maybe implicitly decided that social history couldn't engage larger transnational themes because of this focus on micro history, community studies. Um, you know, perhaps that may come across as elitist, but <laughs> so what, right? Uh, so yeah, you have to, I, I think transnational history hopefully can be an umbrella in which you can do kind of transnational history in which there are, you can show explicit connections, like I'm trying to tease out in my paper, as well as perhaps comparative history among social or groups who don't have access to information that crosses oceans, but who are acting in similar ways, as Leslie suggested, whether they know it or not. So I think that what you might call transnational or transatlantic social history can show can be very valuable in showing parallel movements to illuminate um, anti-exceptionalist tendencies in a in a kind of broader stream. Um, I, I do think that once you kind of go down the transnational path, it's very difficult to come back and to kind of write national history because implicitly you're taught, you're, <coughs> as uh, somebody like Ian Terrell has argued, you know, your national history at some levels implicitly exceptionalist. And I guess I'm kind of in that camp right now. Well, I, I think it's a good question. Um, I think it, it kind of depends on, on what you mean by elites and non-elites. So for example, in, in my work, um, although I don't talk about it as much in this paper, a lot of the connection that's going on between the League and abolitionists is conducted by women who are packing fare boxes and, and who are organizing these bazaars. Uh, of course, from a class perspective, they, they still you know have the means to do that and to travel and to correspond with each other. So in one sense, they're, they're elite. In another sense, they're non-elite. Um, but I do think that um, you know the possibility of writing transnational social history is is, is daunting, but very possible. I mean, this is also the the uh, you know the 19th centuries. If we think of the age of what would we call it, it's an age of migration. You know, it's an age of of global migration on an unprecedented scale. And so, a lot of what happens with that migration is the diffusion of of political ideologies through. I mean, Professor Levine is here. He's written about the the exiles from the the revolutions of 1848 uh, coming to the United States and and bringing their ideology with them. So um, it can be done. I think these three papers maybe lean towards the more intellectual history side of it, but I don't think that the transnational turn itself forecloses what you're asking for. Do you think there's a role for national theology in transnational history? I'm thinking specifically of something like Manifest Destiny, which is born out of a Calvinist tradition, which is something you won't find in Uh, yeah, I, I guess to go, to go back to that, the first question, you know, manifest destiny is, a, is an element, a really important element of American exceptionalism. Um, 
the uh, it's a it's a it's a bedrock element of the argument that America isn't imperial, right? It, 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 America always does not expand into areas heavily populated, doesn't have colonies, um, right up until the 21st century. You know, American policymakers have argued that America is not a colonial power, right? And I think it goes back to this idea that America, even a, America and expansion happens in a vacuum and in a way that's providential and is kind of fulfilling American destiny, which is different from other countries. I, I think, however, you can look at other countries whose ideology rationalizes expansion along in those same categories. If you look at Japan in the early 20th century, um, I mean, I'm really, I mean, this is kind of what I probably would try to study is French rationalization for expansion into Algeria as uh, not using the same language, but using the same kind of ideological categories. Um, so, so the, yeah, national ideology plays an important function. Um, and we need to pay attention to those. But it also is the ingredients for important categorization of, 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 of similar histories of expansion. Setting where compensation sort of comes off the table altogether. You know, Lincoln sort of plays around with that. But if, if you're thinking about sort of a liberal end to slavery or emancipation, it seems like uh, it would be uh, done with uh, an eye towards uh, that not making that sweeping assault upon uh, property rights on the one hand. And also uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II in the 1860s, it seems like the, the fairly rapid uh, progress towards democracy. Uh, seems more revolutionary than liberal, and so it's kind of a big question. But you know, it's, it's I guess the, the challenge is is Potter is Potter missing something by sort of attaching that label to this this period? Uh, yes, Potter was missing a lot because he was <laughs> right in the 1960s, so it was didn't have the benefit of knowing a lot of things that we know, but. Uh, <coughs> I guess liberalism is a very flexible concept, uh, but it is true that it entails the defense of private property, and therefore it doesn't. Uh, it will. You will never find it uh, in uh, in a revolutionary context of that kind, uh, and therefore, if we are talking about it uh, in a context in which pro property is attacked, that we cannot uh, absolutely refer to it. On the other hand, uh, uh, I guess it is a concept that is not just flexible because of uh, all the things we have said, but because it has followed an evolution that uh, has taken it from a more radical type, which was almost contemplating something that was uh, suicidal at the time of the 1848 revolutions, uh, to a progressively uh, less radical type which uh, ended up in a complete involution by the 1870s. So we had to distinguish the time in which we talk about liberalism. We had to distinguish about uh, the context in which we talk about. We had to distinguish uh, the people who advocate it and for what reason and in what event. Um, so my comparison is, a, in a way, is crude and uh, broad sweeping because it is uh, really about the ideologies of two men who believed in sort of comparable uh, ideas which we can relate to that type of liberalism that was around in the 1860s. But I cannot uh, say the same about uh, the liberalism that agitated uh, Europe in 1848 
and the way it uh, uh, informed the ideas and the actions of a lot of revolutionaries on the barricades. And I certainly cannot say the same about liberalism in the 1880s, the way Tim has talked about and, and Leslie as well. Uh, I just want to say one more thing about all this. We had to think about a wider perspective here, not just uh, Europe and the United States, but Latin America as well, because that is also a laboratory for how liberalism starts in a certain way that contemplates sort of certain type of radical possibilities and becomes invo involuted as time goes on. And uh, by the, the, the Latin American historians distinguish clearly between a type of revolutionary liberalism and a type of conservative liberalism as two ideologies that clash against each other. And by the 1870s, the uh, latter one is the one that, uh, in fact, becomes predominant in every Latin American country. I think, um, I think Hobsbawm points out that because of the way that Europe was organized, for example, in the mid-19th century, if you wanted to implement a more liberal polity, uh, first, first you had to become independent, right? First you had to throw out the foreigners and sort of uh, create an independent nation. So war and revolution, in a way, become necessary before you can institute you know, a, a property respecting uh, order. Um, and what that does is it creates all kinds of contradictions and tensions for liberals, because, especially you know, Italians, I think, for example, of having to first uh, fight a war and then uh, try to figure out what the, the limits of, of the liberalization of this new polity will be. But I do have to think that, I do have to say that I think the sort of specter of this revolutionary possibility is constantly in the back of the minds of, of, of 19th century liberals. And they're, they're having, I think, the faith that some of my abolitionists, for example, have in public opinion and the power of public opinion to affect this kind of gradual ameliorative change is constantly uh, shaken by events, right? And revolutions of 1848, for example, coming just after corn law repeal, a lot of the abolitionists reflect on, on the fact that, you know, following this great triumph of the Anti-Corn Law League, they have this other example of, of change of a very different kind of revolutionary change. And so Phillips, for example, in his 1852 and 1853 speeches on public opinion sort of broaches the possibility that um, maybe public opinion won't work in every, in every national context, uh, but maybe that's why it's so important that we as Americans demonstrate that it can work here, right? So they are kind of, they are kind of uh, always aware of this other more uh, more violent, more revolutionary kind of change. It's a tangential answer to, to that question, I think. I want to pose a, a follow-up, really, on the very first question and put a, a sharper point on it and direct it really at Caleb because it was already, already suggested by, by Leslie, and that is because abolitionism and the anti crime law movement were directed at mobilizing rather differently comprised political publics, mm -hmm. um, yeah. whether they used or were forced to use rather different methods, I think you mentioned the use of women as a similarity, but abolitionism engaged what, po popular literature, art, song, theater, put the victim on stage uh, in, in former slaves, all those things that infuriated the defenders of slavery because they had mobilized a rather broad public. Are, are, really, are the differences as interesting as the similarities here? Um. I think that's true. Uh, sort of in response to the, the actual tactics, uh, a lot of hist recent historians of the anti corn Law League are uncovering a lot more of the kind of very dramatic uh, propagandistic uh, tactics that the League used, like, um, you know, at a meeting, not throwing down shackles on the table, but putting down a loaf of bread, right, and describing the Corn Laws as, as a bread tax, you know, on the people. Or I've actually um, discovered, of course, William Lloyd Garrison is is most famous possibly for on, on the 4th of July, 1854, at an abolitionist picnic, burning a copy of the Constitution, right, and leading the, the crowd in, in a, a recitation, uh, a sort of chanting, you know, uh, down with tyranny. Uh, but actually, a few years before, um, in the Anti-Corn Law League campaign, campaign uh, there's an example of a British minister, um, I think his name is Massey, who uh, burns a copy of the Corn Laws uh, in, a, in a public meeting. So there are these same kinds of dramatic appeals to, to public opinion. But I do, I do think that 
uh, when abolitionists draw on the Anticornell League, they are they are overlooking all sorts of differences uh, between uh, the two the two movements. They're seeing what they want to see. I mean, uh, ultimately, the Anticornell League turns <clears throat> from propaganda to more kind of electioneering tactics and attempts to redraw. Uh, you know, boroughs and things like that to, to allow um, uh, League members of parliament to be elected. And of course, the Garrisonians don't talk as much about that, uh, whereas the, the political abolitionists are more inclined to see that as a case of why we need to, to, to elect officials into Congress. Um, I think it's still important what they wanted to see. And that's kind of the main point that I would make is that, yes, Garrisonians had these blind spots in the, in the ways that they read the anti corn Law League. Uh, but I think it's, it's telling that they wanted an example of how their tactics worked. Uh, they weren't just interested in kind of washing their hands and burning the Constitution and withdrawing from, from political efficacy, but that they were actually interested in trying to demonstrate that these were tactics that would work. So, but I agree with you that there were lots of differences between the two. So. Any other questions? All right, do the panelists have anything else to weigh in on? Well, just <laughs> on the previous question, I think the other paradigm of the 19th century besides British liberalism is the specter of the French Revolution and the way that it casts a shadow over the potential for disaster in reform movements, especially reform movements who start tinkering with property rights, which is a negative influence perhaps on American reformers as much as British, British liberalism is in terms of a positive kind of spin. All right, well thank you very much to our panelists and thank you to the audience for coming out.